It is being conducted under IFF's project Panoptic, which is India's first facial recognition systems tracker that aims to bring transparency and accountability to the development and deployment of these systems while also advocating for policy change. One of the reasons we launched Project Panoptic was that there was very little conversation around how harmful this technology is. Um, so we wanted to raise awareness around this issue and through our project inform people about the secretive nature of the deployment of the surveillance technology. With the launch of the Panoptic Talk series, we aim to take this forward by calling experts uh, from India and abroad to discuss the intricacies of the ethical, legal, and technical ramifications of this technology to ensure that IFF's community and the larger audience can benefit from the experience of those who work tirelessly on this issue. Today we have with us Professor Animesh Mukherjee and Siddharth Jaiswal who have authored the research paper to face adversarial audit of commercial facial recognition systems along with Kartikeya Dugirala and Abhishek Das. Siddharth is a PhD student at the Department of CSE at IIT Kharagpur. His research interests uh, revolve around fairness and bias in e-commerce and facial recognition systems. Professor Animesh is an associate professor and um, AK Singh Ch Chair at the Department of CSE at IIT Kharagpur, interested in online content governance with special stress on mitigation of biases in two-sided recommendation platforms. Um, thank you so much for being here today. Um, before we start our discussion, uh, Siddharth will make a so short presentation on the paper. Uh, the floor is yours, Siddharth, go ahead. Okay, sure. Thanks for the nice introduction. Um, please let me know if my screen is visible. Yes, it is. Go ahead. Okay, great. So uh, I'll be talking about our paper, Two Face Adversarial Audit of Commercial Face, Reco Face Recognition Systems. This was recently accepted at a conference, uh, AAAI ICWSM, which is to happen in 2022. Um, let's talk about face recognition systems first. So these systems are basically a setup which involves a camera and an ML or a DL model running in the packet together which in tandem try to identify faces in images or videos. One of the most common applications that probably everybody would know of is a mobile, cam, uh, a mobile uh, face unlocking system. And there are some new uses which uh, we are currently seeing. For example, check-in counters at airports and public places within cities. And these are being deployed all around the world. Uh, in fact, uh, even Bangalore airport has started this uh, very recently. And one thing to note is that current uh, technology is advanced enough to identify faces with a high level of accuracy. But there are some reports that we see from around the world which are uh, concerning this technology, specifically with related to India when it comes to identifying uh, individuals at a riot. And uh, South Korea has recently come up with uh, this technology to track individuals of interest, which in this case are COVID-19 positive cases. But the concerns are more worrying when it comes to an ethical perspective. These, uh, this technology tends to violate human rights in a lot of places. And there are a lot of dangers which come along with the, uh, with the use of this technology. Surveillance cameras specifically are being deployed to identify people. And if there are chances of misidentification, then it leads to a very high level of risk for the individuals involved because they could be uh, wrongly imprisoned or uh, charged with crimes that they might not have committed. Similarly, users in social media, for example, the Facebook article that you can see on the bottom right, where the AI was used to automatically tag people labeled black men as primates, also has very uh, wrong implications on the uh, perspective that uh, the society has of such kind of people. This makes us beg the question, how do we expose deficiencies of such systems? The main answer, unfortunately, is not very easy because commercial FRSs are not available for in-depth evaluation. The research community is performing audit-based studies on these, and uh, there are some very popular works, for example, Gender Shades and Saving Face. And these projects have been able to identify a very significant amount of bias against different gender and racial groups specifically by the FRSs by Amazon, Microsoft, and IBM, which are very large uh, corporations which are propagating these uh, biases across the world. Now I'll talk about what we have done in our work. So the existing projects that I just talked about and a few others have evaluated FRSs for images as you see on the screen, which are fairly normal images. 
but we have tried to go to a different area of research and we have tried to study these biases in an adversarial setting to understand what i mean by an adversarial setting i'll try to give an example um consider the case of a cctv camera deployed in let's say a public square now this cctv camera is exposed to different kinds of natural elements like rain and dust and it ever so often happens that a droplet of water on the camera lens can destroy the image or make it blur as you can see on the right hand side similarly social media applications like instagram and snapchat allow people to modify or edit their images and add different kinds of filters as you can see on the left hand side a grainy filter has been applied to the images so the question that we have posed is how do commercial lfrs perform on such type of images where the input is not as you would expect but a very realistic possible scenario that can happen in the world before we move forward i'll give a slight overview of the kind of systems that we've evaluated and the data sets that we've used so in this project we've evaluated three uh, frss the first is amazon aws recognition the second is face plus plus and the third is detect by microsoft azure also there were three data sets that we evaluated our uh, our uh, frss on the first is celeb set second is fairface and the third is chicago face database all of these data sets have a healthy amount of diversity in terms of the racial groups and the genders that we have and what we have observed here is that for the white male on the left hand side the frss identify the gender of the male correctly for either the original image and the blurry image but the same cannot be said for the black people where we see that all the frss are changing their prediction for the blurry image and microsoft in fact has predicted the gender to be male in the original case which is even more of a concern we were after the observation in the previous slide we uh, asked ourselves whether this was a one off scenario and as you can see in this graph it's not so i'll talk about this graph and this result is basically the study of gender accuracy for fair face on the amazon uh, frs before i start explaining the explaining the graph i'll talk about all the variables that you can see here the terms orig rgb and spread refer to the original set of images the grainy images and the blurry images that i just showed you and by accuracy we mean that the predicted gender is same as the actual gender and we try to count how many instances this happens on if we have 100 images then we'll see how many images have the correct gender accuracy <clears throat> if now moving on to the result we can see that the original images have a very high accuracy of 92% but as soon as you apply the rgb filter the accuracy drops to 50% and interestingly the blurry images do not have a very high drop in accuracy well this result is interesting in itself it does not tell us much about the bias that might be propagated between different intersectional groups so we dug deeper and we found this result where we are measuring the difference between the highest accuracy and the lowest accuracy across different intersectional groups now by an intersectional group i mean that there are multiple racial groups and there are the male and female gender for each racial group and each such combination becomes an intersectional group for example in this table there are four intersectional groups that you can see middle eastern female southeast asian male east asian female and east asian male. in the results you can see that the rgb filtered images have a very high disparity which means that the accuracy between east asian females and east asian males is 73.6% and even for the original images and the uh, blurry images the differences are in double digits and the commonality here is that all the uh, images which are on the losing side of this argument are asian males either east asian males or southeast asian males and the maximum absolute increase in the disparity is as high as 63% from the original disparity that we see we have a lot of other results for different tasks frss and the other data sets and we, i'd refer you to the paper for further details in the interest of time i'll like to conclude our talk here 
And as conclusion, I would like to state that while FRSs are very helpful for a different for a wide variety of services, there are a lot of existing biases and wrongful applications which can lead and are leading to dystopian outcomes. Therefore, it is very important to recontextualize the technology and remove the existing biases, if not at least stop stopping it completely. And our current work, while focuses on multiple standard data sets and the task of face recognition, we are extending and working towards performing similar kind of tasks in the Indian context and for different sets of tasks that can uh, that can that these systems can be evaluated for. With this, I'd like to conclude. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Siddharth, um, not just for the presentation, but what I believe is extremely important work. And I think um, uh, you are all are the first, among the first in India to, you know, do this. Um, so I'm just going to jump into the questions that I have for you, and I'm hoping this will be a very interesting decision, a discussion. Um, and the first and foremost question that I want to ask you is, um, why did you choose to do this project? I mean, what made you interested um, in doing this? And when did you decide that you want to assess bias in facial recognition systems? Okay, uh, so basically, uh, Animesh sir teaches a course at IIT Kharagpur uh, called AI and Ethics. And I took that course in the uh, spring semester this year. And in that course, we came across different kinds of systems that have existing biases and fairness issues. And one of the comp uh, components of that course was facial recognition systems. So that is where I got introduced to this topic. And uh, I did a term project on this topic as well. And from there on, we extended that term project into the full paper that you see. And one of my personal reasons for getting into this area was the societal implications that this technology can have. Definitely. Um, so that's that's what I want to also talk about uh, a little later. First of all, because we have you with us and you you do know so much about the technical side, I want to get into the technical part of yeah. things a little. Mm -hmm. um, so in simple terms, can you tell us how exactly does a facial recognition algorithm work um, from start to end? How is it developed and then how is it deployed and how does it work entirely? Okay, so here's the catch, right? For commercial face recognition systems, there is no way to know how it's working. Simply because of the fact that they do not share the, the information of the models that they are using. Now by a model, I mean a machine learning or a deep learning architecture, which is taking the photo, as, photo or video as an input and trying to identify features which can help it eventually identify the face of a person. So the general idea is that you show the, let's say that there's a black box and you show it a photo and that can have anything. And the task that you're trying to solve for is to identify or predict whether there's a face in that photo or not with a certain level of confidence. By confidence, I mean that you're trying to see how good you are at predicting that. And you, try to supply your black box a lot of examples, thousands and thousands of examples, so that it eventually learns to identify which of the images had a face and which of them did not. And you reward the black box for every correct prediction. And this is how it's going to learn to predict correct faces. After which, and this process is called training, and then you are going to deploy it in the real world setting where it's going to see a face in some public place or maybe in, at the airport. And then it is again going to try to identify whether there's a face in the photo or not based on what it has learned to be seen. So this is how most of the commercial systems work. Earlier, the technology that was used uh, was in some sense very basic, but now the uh, technology has taken a huge leap and it's very advanced. And as you saw, we were seeing accuracies of over 90% for the original set of images which I would believe is a very high accuracy for images that you see in normal scenarios out in the world. Definitely. Um, so you said that um, at the start of your answer, you said that there's no real way for us, for you to know how these yeah. algorithms work for the commercial ones. So um, why is that? What were the limitations that you faced in terms of accessing the FRT systems that you did use and which ones could you not use? And why was that? Was that because of intellectual property or um, any other thing? Okay. Uh, so the thing is that let's take the example of uh, Amazon, right? Now, 
the way that we interact with Amazon's face recognition system is through an API call, which means that there is some. Um, so the basic idea is that I can only give Amazon the photo and I can only get back the result for that photo. I do not know how Amazon is performing this calculation because it's performing its calculation somewhere in the cloud, right? So it has its model there and I send the photo to that service and that service returns the responses to me. And that response contains various values like the gender, the age, and whether the person is showing some emotion or not, whether the person is smiling or not. And these kind of answers are what we are getting. So it's not really a question of IP violation or something because to violate an IP, we would actually at least need to know what the IP is. The problem here is that the companies are not ready to share the information that they have. And from a company's perspective, the idea is that they are trying to get better and better at doing this task. And if they share their uh, valuable information, it's very easy to replicate and advance on those things these days, right? So that's one of the issues. The other, there's one way to get around this in some sense. Uh, which is something called model cards, wherein a company can at least provide basic information of their model. For example, the data that they have used to train their model and a basic overview of the architecture that their model has. But most of the companies that we are seeing uh, currently, especially with re respect to facial recognition systems, do not provide model cards either. So that is another hurdle in the way of evaluating such systems. So. Uh... Maybe I can add a little bit of my take on this. So uh, going back to the two questions that you asked one after the other, Anushka. So uh, the basic idea here is that there is an algorithm back, back end of, for the, all these companies. And this algorithm is not known to us. This is a step-by-step -step process that uh, actually works on a bunch of images and you absolutely have no idea as to what these images are and what the company is showing to its algorithm. So the algorithm is seeing like uh, a stream of uh, uh, like say thousands or even 10,000s or even millions of uh, images. And these images are those from where the algorithm is trying to learn its inferencing pattern. So now you are mostly interacting with the with these uh, systems as a uh, as an end user, where you have the liberty only to like input your face, which is like a test case for the algorithm, and the algorithm gives you a prediction. So, and you have absolutely no way to understand like how the algorithm came up with this prediction, because you do not have access to the step by step, you know, approach that the algorithm is taking in order to make this decision. So uh, like an issue of the uh, IP or the release of the IP. So in so the, the point is that uh, in the first place, we do not know the IP at all. So the violation comes much later, only when we know about it. So we do not even know what is the IP, what is the intellectual property or the black box uh, uh, algorithm as uh, Siddharth was trying to point out is there uh, hidden in that uh, system. So that is the biggest problem. So you basically, so as scientists also, not only as uh, layman end users, as scientists also, you are actually handicapped as end users. You are no better than end users. That's why this entire area of auditing has come up, which is also called the third party auditing. So basically you are a third party to the system. You go, you have the liberty to ask a bunch of questions, and from there, you try to make a guess as to whether some sort of a bias is perpetuating in the system. But you do not have any control on the algorithm. And therefore, you, it's impossible to actually you know, go back and tell or suggest the uh, makers of the algorithm as to, OK, these, these things have gone wrong. So therefore, you should be uh, trying to look into these stuff uh, to have a fix on them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. Um, and I think um, with regard to what you're saying, I think this is very important that we're discussing this right now, but it's also important for us to remember that um, the second part of your the 
the main part of your project is that you've done this on adversarial images. Now, coming to adversarial images, why is it important for us to look at adversarial images? Um, I mean, I know this for a fact that these systems are already in use, but um, what happens when you introduce images with adversarial inputs to these facial recognition systems? Yeah, maybe Siddharth, you can take up and then I'll add up. Yeah, sure. So the idea behind, behind these adversarial inputs uh, stem from the fact that these systems are being deployed in very real public settings, right? So let's take the example of the blurry image that I showed. Now, if a CCTV or a surveillance camera is being deployed in a very public setting, like some town square, and it's being used to identify people that are passing on the street, it's very likely that it is going to have rain on the camera lenses, like raindrops or dust and, or different kinds of natural elements, right? And the camera system is still going to continue functioning even under such circumstances. So we wanted to study whether the accuracy and the disparity in the accuracy is changing when we are introducing such adversarial settings to the uh, face recognition system because it's easy to identify faces when they are in proper lighting and proper let's say distance and angle but when you are trying to introduce certain perturbations to the input then the algorithm might start to malfunction or it might start to behave in a way that we did not expect for example, as we showed in the uh, disparity table, the accuracy, like the disparity shot up by almost 63% as soon as we introduced grainy images. And that is a very realistic scenario for faces, facial images that are being pulled off the internet, right? Because there are a lot of people who are interacting with social media these days, like in Instagram, or let's say um, what's happening is that let's say some automatic tagging application or maybe some uh, application which is just sifting through thousands of images to identify people of interest is also going through these images. And there's a very high likelihood that if it identifies normal image of the same person. So this was the motivation for studying adversarial settings. And to uh, like just uh, knock this point home. I have like, so basically we've come across a lot of news articles, which have been, you know, circulating around about these adversarial settings without mentioning the fact that these are adversarial settings. Right? For example, the Facebook article that I talked about. So there is no way to know why the model was tagging black men as prime news. But there is a likelihood that it could have been because the model was not equipped to handle images on Facebook, which might not have been the same images as you would see normally, right? Similarly, very recently, there was a study on Twitter where the cropping algorithm was explicitly cropping out black people when it was being run automatically, right? So again, you see that these are societal biases which are being reflected online. And under adversarial conditions, these are becoming even more, uh, I would say, dangerous to the end user at the, uh, you know, who's uh, interacting with these services. So this is why I guess, like, I mean, this is how I can simply explain as in why we chose to study these adversarial examples. Yeah. So uh, uh, the main reason, you know, Anushka, so. Uh, uh, all, so while one part of it is that we do not know the algorithms, the other part, uh, and in fact, a much more important part, I would say, is that we also do not know what data these companies are showing to these algorithms. Maybe the data in the first place. So it's, it's just my hypothesis and which kind of like resonates when you see the results on the, in the adversarial setup much more. So is that uh, the, the, the type of data that uh, the uh, algorithms are seeing uh, as training examples seem to be very, very skewed. So basically, uh, so as Siddharth was talking about the different intersectional groups, uh, even in their initial gender shades paper, they show that uh, certain intersectional groups like uh, were, were uh, performing very good, whereas the other intersectional groups were performing uh, very bad. The model was performing very bad. And then over the years, it has been seen that uh, somehow the have cooked up with those intersectional groups. And now if you read on the algorithms 
on those like uh, less represented intersectional groups, the, the results are not so bad. Uh, because like over the time, probably these companies have included more and more data set uh, representing this particular uh, less represented intersectional group in the first place. And therefore now the model is doing better. Now, the moment you introduce these adversarial conditions, you again start seeing that there is a uh, like there is a like underrepresentation of the data. So basically, what is happening that uh, like uh, while uh, the uh, section of uh, the data set which uh, represents certain particular well-represented uh, intersectional group, there the model is capable of even the blurry and the grainy images. Whereas when you go to the less uh, represented group, there again the model fails to actually handle the uh, grainy and blurry images. So, so that skew actually perpetuates. So you just slightly change the uh, like uh, input setup and you see that the same bias actually is perpetuating. So this is very interesting. If you, if you think like, uh, you know, uh, in a very mechanicistic way or, or in a very modular way, then this is not going to uh, work. So if you have to really circumvent the problem, you will have to think in a more holistic way. And as Siddharth was rightly pointing out, so unless you as a company are going to release at least the model cards, it would be like no way possible to, uh, to get away with this queue at a, at a holistic level, I would say. So it will be only like, you know, uh, solving the pro problem like as and when it comes, and it will be mostly a pocketed solution rather than a holistic solution. So they will be only responding to the problems, but they will not be preempting the problems is what you're Absolutely, trying. yes. Exactly. Um, so in your paper, when I was going through it, I, I was uh, really captivated by this one sentence which said that facial recognition systems are not meant for identifying individuals in the criminal justice system. Um, now we know that this is not uh, what is happening actually, um, but I wanted to ask you why, why have um, the authors mentioned this and why, why, did, why do you hold this opinion that it should not be used in the criminal justice system? Anybody, if you can take it, yeah. Siddharth. Okay. Yeah, maybe Siddharth, you can start yeah. off. Okay, so the idea is that the criminal justice system is using data from the people who are already convicted. And what we see is that the conviction rates for certain groups, certain intersectional groups, I'd say, is already very high due to different societal biases that exist, right? Now, what's going to happen is that if I always teach you how to see an apple, then you'll always know what an apple is, but you won't know what the origin is, right? So this is what's happening here. If I am constantly telling you that most people who are, uh, you know, criminally active are black men, then that is what the algorithm is going to learn. Even though you're not explicitly telling, you're giving it a proxy in the sense that you're showing it more images of men who have been convicted of some crime and they turn out to be black American. And now if you you're asking for a test image, as Sir said, which is also of a black man. The system is going to be more confident of saying that this particular person might be a criminal or might have a chance of committing a crime. Whereas it's not going to predict the same for, let's say, a white man. There was a very interesting work by ProPublic on this, which did not use uh, uh, facial recognition systems, but it talked about the recidivism rates. Using, the tech, uh, using a software called Compass. And there as well, it was noticed that people from black neighborhoods were being wrongfully uh, predicted to have a higher chance of recidivism than people from more affluent neighborhoods with the higher population of white, white people, right? So this is why we hold the opinion that using such a system in the criminal justice system uh, specifically might turn out to have more cons than pros because of the already existing bias that uh, has led to the convictions that we see in society, right? And just to add on to this, we've also seen such examples in the Indian context. For example, there was a recent report that Aadhaar was going to be deployed in the state of Jharkhand for facial recognition, right? And the issue there is that the places where it was supposed to be deployed were the tribal villages. 
now the facial recognition systems that are being developed by corporates are not really trained on such face, face images right they are trained on, on people under very proper lighting conditions with a proper angle and a distance and it's very likely although i hope not but it's very likely that such systems are again going to propagate biases on people who are firstly digitally illiterate and secondly who are not really who who the algorithm has not previously seen and this is where the issue of bias is going to creep in slowly and slowly and with the scale that india operates in this these kind of biases can occur in different kind of scenarios across religions religious lines across caste lines across geographical lines right so these are some of the issues that we need to think about so uh, anushka before i respond uh, uh, to your uh, uh, question uh, uh, let me uh, let me uh, step back a little and uh, try to ask you a question to generate the answer so uh, uh, so uh, take a second and describe a banana to me Yeah, I see that your professor hat is on. Um, a banana is a fruit that it has a yellow covering, and it's um, usually long uh, in a in a in a particular ovalish shape, long oval shape. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. So you have served my purpose. So uh, see, when you were describing banana. you never felt that a banana could be also green in color okay but a banana could be equally green in color and probably uh, the most part of its lifetime it is green in color but in our brain it's ingrained to be yellow in color so if human perception is so biased think about ma- teaching machine learning systems to like um, you know judge or add judge somebody to be a criminal so how detrimental it could be so that was basically the point which made us or this this was the thinking from which which made me at least write that statement in the paper so i guess this probably more or less answers you sort of summarizes the answer for you <laughs> yes definitely it does and it also flows into my next question which is um so what you just showed was that i am biased against Uh, green bananas um so how does a bias actually creep into ai algorithms so what we have been thinking is that ai artificial intelligence facial recognition systems they're going to be perfect that that is the myth right but your paper and multiple researchers have been showing us that ai bias exists and it does have an effect on the um on these perfect um systems so how does bias actually creep into ai algorithms and how can it be removed completely ever okay so uh, maybe i can take this up and then uh, if siddharth has to add something uh, he can do so uh, uh, see the issue is that uh, one of the uh, most important points that i also told uh, uh in uh, like you know a few minutes back uh, discussion uh, is that uh, you know there is a huge skew in the data that you show to the ai algorithms and this all these ai algorithms modern day ai algorithms are highly data hungry and highly data intensive so if you are showing data uh, uh like uh, in a particular way to this uh, learning algorithms this that are present in the data itself see why have uh, most of us like made a perception that a banana is yellow in color because that's how we have started we have you know been taught to perceive a banana so basically even so so my my take is that uh, uh, even if you give the entire data that is available on the web to a uh, to an ai algorithm you are not going to Uh, be able to make it bias free because the the simple reason uh, behind this is that you know uh, so every moment suppose you are generating one example for a green banana okay and that is getting uploaded somewhere uh, in the web but uh, 
in response to that one single green banana example, there might be thousands of yellow banana examples that are already getting uploaded at the same moment of the same point in time. So therefore, as like, you know, as we say that the data volume is increasing, we are getting a lot of data. This disparity of data, this disparity uh, in the data is also increasing. So with the increase in the volume, so earlier it was, uh, I would say the situation was a little bit better because the the uh, the dispar the growth of disparity between the two forms of data was kind of linear. Now, since the volume of data has become so large that this disparity has become like nonlinear, the growth of this disparity has become nonlinear, and that actually uh, like uh, makes me like think a little bit more uh, in a pessimistic way that probably we are not going to you know be able to handle this kind of biases if we are always trying to think in a data centric way. So we have to come up with alternative ways to address this problem. Yeah, and I know that uh, your next question would be probably as to what to uh, do with these alternative techniques. We'll come to that, but maybe let's allow Siddharth to add his points on this. Uh, so most of my points are like what Sir has already talked about. Um, just to add, uh, I guess I completely agree with Sir on the fact that it's impossible to remove machine biases. It's like, I, okay, I'd say that it's very difficult to remove machine biases unless we are able to remove human biases as well, right? Because the person who is building up the system, he's the one deciding on how his model is getting trained. He's the one who's supplying the data, right? So until a human is also able to think in a holistic way, as Sir pointed out earlier, it's going to be very unlikely and very difficult that we're going to see a revolution in terms of how the models are uh, dealing with these biases. So, uh, so I think uh, Siddharth, you dropped off for a while or was it myself? No, no, I was able to hear him perfectly. Okay, okay. okay. Yes. Um, so actually my next question is um, in addition to I definitely want to hear about the alternative techniques that you've uh, mentioned. But uh, my question was that, uh, do you think that FRT can be used for different use cases if bias is removed? Uh, and you've just said it can't be removed completely, but it is reduced to a certain extent. So for example, if they make it 95 or 99%, um, do you think FRT can be used in certain use cases? And which use cases um, do you think it should never be used? Like, for example, like the criminal justice system, as you've already mentioned, it should never be used. So are there any other use cases that you can think of um, where it happens like that? Siddharth, you want to take this up? Um, no, I guess you can. Uh, OK. so. Uh, I think uh, uh, again, Anushka. Let us let us get back to some simple examples because. And so, say uh, you are like uh, taking a stroll inside a mall, and then there is this uh, FRT system uh, running after you. Say the the mall owner might have like installed it uh, to uh, know your preferences. Uh, your like uh, say eating habits because you might be selecting some of the restaurants there inside the mall most more often than the others so according to that he might be planning to, he or she might be planning to uh, give you promotions and things like that so so uh, so this is one case whereas on the other side there is this criminal justice uh, uh, issue or there is this customs clearance issue so so these are uh, like the different use cases where you can think of. And you see in each of these case, what is important is not about like whether we are able to use an FRT or not, but whether we are able to be like, you know, whether we are accountable for why we are using the FRT. Okay. By that, I mean, like whenever you make a prediction, I'm not I do not care about whether it's 90% or 95%. What I care about is whether my model is able to explain to me in correct and succinct terms that why it has been, 
why this particular prediction has been made. Suppose some age or some gender or some other uh, more important uh, like attribute has been predicted about me. Like why the model thinks that this should be the correct prediction for me. And that should be in front of my eyes and also in front of the evaluator's eyes. Unless this explainability part is tagged with a model, I do not think any, I mean, any level of bias freeness would work. I think that's also the, the, the difficulty that, you know, like you mentioned, it should also be apparent to the person using the FRT that why this answer is coming and they should be able to make that um, uh, judgment that this is the logic so maybe the logic can be incorrect assuming that frt is always going to be right is also an issue and i don't think uh, the people who are going to be using frt for example um people in the police or people who are using for you know we've seen the use of FRT for voter verification so people who are sitting in the voter lines um i don't think they have the ability to actually ascertain um the technical um background of the FRT right and I think that is also a difficulty um, so that is why they will automatically assume that because it's a technology it's going to be right and that is also going to be an issue um, you've you've uh, mentioned saving face and gender shades in your um, paper so um, these are some of the studies that have been done abroad um, in USA. Um, so have your results also been similar um, to what they found? Or uh, was, was there any difference in what you found and what they found? And what was the difference, if any? So maybe Siddharth, you can yeah, take this up. Yeah, sure. This is a more technical question. Yeah, so I can sure. take... Okay, so um, gender shades was uh, like that work came out in 2019 and saving face came out in 2020. And we compared our results with saving face on the uh, celeb set data set, which was basically the common data set uh, between saving face and our paper. And we, in fact, identified that the age accuracy percentages have gone down, whereas the gender accuracy has slightly gone up, which basically points to the fact that even these companies are constantly trying to optimize their algorithms to improve on certain factors, but at the cost of other features that they are feeling. Just one yeah. question there. Yeah, sure. um, was your study done on the same facial recognition algorithms as saving face? The same or system, was? the yeah. same systems. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. we evaluated on aid of Amazon, um, Microsoft and Peace Plus Plus and uh, saving face also used two of these three. They also used Amazon and Microsoft and they used another system called Clarify, which we chose not to go ahead with. And, for this particular work. So the uh, point that I was saying is that the accuracies are decreasing for age and increasing slightly for gender and uh, slightly for smile as well. And that's the issue that we've seen here, right? Uh, one, if it's like you are pushing one knob upwards and the other knob is immediately coming down. So there's no sweet spot there that they are able to find. And that is probably mostly because they are not trying to address the root of the problem, which as Sir has already pointed out, is the data-centric way of thinking about such uh, systems, right? So it might be that they are providing better examples for gender, but the data that they're providing does not have enough variety for age, right? So these are the kind of uh, differences that we see. And while we've not compared our results with gender shades, uh, that's primarily because of a technical reason. Uh, the fact that we could not access the data set that gender shades uh, paper was based on. And we did not want to be making any claims against gender shades without having access to the same data set. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm coming to my last question, and this is more of a non technical question. So, um, under IFF's project Panoptic, which is our project, uh, which maps facial recognition, we have called for a ban on the use of this technology for government entities, police, and other security and intelligence agencies. Um, according to you, should this technology, should the use of this technology for these entities be banned? Um, or do you think there is some way in which it can still be used without violating rights? Uh, okay, so let me take this up. So uh, 
I think like at this point, uh, I mean, um, leave alone India, uh, the world is not prepared to use these kind of technologies uh, for uh, such sensitive um, like uh, uh, task uh, at hand. So, so you see, like um, even if I uh, tell that, uh, okay, uh, so let me let me take a first step. Use this uh, system. Try to see what the judgment is, and then I'll bring an expert in the loop, and get that person's judgment. Now, the moment you uh, show the judgment of the system to the expert, there is a possibility that the expert's decision gets biased by this. And this has been actually recorded and reported in multiple uh, scenarios earlier. So I would be extremely skeptic to uh, you know, uh, include these kind of systems into uh, such uh, like um, very sensitive applications where a human life is involved, uh, like uh, a prime time of a person's uh, career is involved and things like that. So. Uh, so uh, there has been like uh, systems uh, which are being deployed for uh, CV shortlisting and things like that. So I would say those are, you know, you know, these those are like uh, much less sensitive and um, even a little bit of bias there or even a large bias there with a from those biases over time uh, is OK for me. But for sensitive systems like uh, those that you have called out, I, my vote is no, no. Yeah, uh, Siddharth, you can go ahead. Yeah, I completely agree. Uh, so for when it comes to sensitive applications, as we've already mentioned in our paper, uh, law enforcement services should not be using these technologies at this moment. And until there is an explanation attached to the a response or uh, a better way to, ident uh, to uh, identify faces in a privacy preserving way. This technology also has ramifications in other areas, but uh, specifically for sensitive government applications or surveillance or things like that. Uh, thank you so much. That makes me so happy to hear it because, you know, I have been talking to researchers and I've been talking to uh, lawyers and they have always said that, okay, this technology should be banned. But now we also have people from the technical community uh, agreeing that, you know, this, this technology should not be used and that makes me really happy. Um, so that's all. Uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Firstly, I would like to thank Professor Animesh and Siddharth for taking the time to come and talk to us today about the paper. It's a very important paper. And we've shared it with our community. Uh, I would suggest each and every uh, everyone who's interested in this topic should definitely go out and read this paper. Um, I also want to thank the entire IFF team that has helped make today's event happen, which includes Shivani Singh and Ashlesh. Um, lastly, I want to thank a community which engages with us so eagerly and purposefully whenever we organize such an event. If you're interested in volunteering for Project Panoptic uh, more closely, please do write to me at anushka at internetfreedom.in. Um, thank you to everyone who attended the talk today, and I'll see you in the next one. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks a lot, Anushka, for inviting both of us. It was a pleasure talking to all of you.